What's up, everybody? Happy Friday to you all. For those joining in live, it's been a little bit since we've taken the air, but uh, we've got a lot of stuff, good stuff, fun stuff, uh, some b like stuff we normally do and some with a little twist on it, but we've got a lot of stuff for you here on the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. I'm Anthony Cazenza. He is the man, the myth, the legend, John Sheeran. And we are cruising into a holiday weekend. John, how you doing, my man? Doing good. Uh, already, the holiday, I think, already started, which is why we re are recording today on Friday instead of Thursday, because it was a national, not a national, was a citywide holiday in Cincinnati. Everyone, I hope, enjoyed opening day festivities. The Reds won, yeah. I believe, 8-2 yeah. to two over the 2019 World Series champions, Nationals. I, I don't know if this, like, we're going to get into a lot of stats in the next month or so when it comes to draft, and a lot of the stats that I like to bring up have, a lot, like, a strong correlation to future NFL success. Jay Morrison did relay a stat that I don't think is as cor cor um, doesn't have as strong of a correlation, but apparently the Bengals don't do so well when the Reds dominate an opening day. Apparently like there's been like 10 uh -oh. times when the Reds have scored like eight runs or more in opening day and the Bengals have only made the playoffs like once in those following years. So again, if, if I learn that, I guess you got to learn that too. It's just like, oh, wow, that's a really <laughs> random and discouraging stat it considering is. how dominant the Reds were. But, you know, Reds are 1 0, and I guess we got we got a minute before we, the Bengals get there, I guess. Well, in this, this is why the Bengals have Jamar Chase, Joe Burrow, and company to break these kinds of dubious curses that have uh, followed them around for so many years. And, uh, yeah, hopefully, while, while I am happy about the Reds and them uh, taking care of business on opening day. Let's hope that that streak does not continue. And of course the great Jay Morrison, we got to get him on the show sometime, um, you know, coming up with the, the obscure stats. I like it. I like it. Uh, this is the orange and black insider Bengals podcast. As I mentioned, you can get this show on a number of different platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google podcasts, iHeartRadio, all of the major ones, we are there. So subscribe on the audio side of things. And if you like the video side, you got to give a thumbs up to the Cincy Jungle Facebook page, as well as our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that by clicking the show icon underneath John Sheeran and by that Cincy Jungle icon there. Click that. Click the subscribe button once you click that show icon. And then you got to give uh, our videos a thumbs up and click the bell to be notified when we go live. And when uh, so you can be notified when we go live and when new content is available. Few clicks there for you, a little bit of work, but hey, it's like three or four clicks. I promise it's not gonna it's not gonna be overly tedious for you. I don't think. Uh, and we're gonna keep cruising through this off season with a lot of different materials. So you're gonna want to do that, and you're gonna of course want to keep it to CincyJungle.com for your podcast, Bengals news, opinions, analysis, etc. As well as my guy's side over there, A to Z Sports.com breaking things down on the Bengals and, of course, the AFC North as a whole. So let's dive right in. The Bengals kind of got in this. I, I think we got to give a hat tip to our guy, James Rapine, over at uh, All Bengals and Sports Illustrated and, of course, the Locked on Bengals podcast. Uh, he and his crew have reported that the uh, Joe Burrow recovery timeline has kind of been, I don't know, accelerated or maybe just uh, on the – on the faster side of the timeline that we heard about. And so he may, even though the team has not made an announcement, uh, reports are saying that he is starting to throw after suffering that wrist injury in the middle later portion of last year. Yeah. So I think the official word is that he's like beginning the process of getting ramped up to obviously his normal level of activity and everything like that. And he told Ben baby of ESPN 
earlier this month that the plan was, you know, trying to get fully cleared by maybe mid-May, maybe late May, early June in that general time range, which would fall in line to like the like the six-month recovery plan from uh, his original surgery date. But there was like I think he works at Black Sheep. Um, I, I don't know the official yeah. title of the, uh, the 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 training. It's like facility, athletic but, performance. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So so he, he's he's still there. He's lifting weights. You know, he's go, going through all that process, and you know, he can he can use his he can use his hand. I guess is like the the main takeaway here. Like he's lifting weights. You know, he, he's operating like a normal human being, which means that you, you know he can <laughs> he, he can grip things, and that maybe include a football here here too. So yeah, he's I think he's begun that process, and he's not you know not ripping it you know 50 yards down the field just yet and taking all these reps or anything but i think we we just kind of peeked behind the curtain of how this process kind of gets ramped up and, and where he is at the moment uh you're, you're just so you know john your mic's kind of cutting out a little bit just um if you can check that out but uh yeah i mean it, it, the good news on that too is um you know we've we i think prior to this like a month prior and that sort of thing uh we had seen Burrow at public events and, you know, whether I think it was the UFC fight or just kind of out and about. And he uh, was kind of shaking hands with his with with his left hand. And, you know, you saw the splint and, and cast thing still on the wrist. And so I think a lot of people were going, oh, man, you know, what's going on with this? And, you know, to hear this now that he is, uh, you know, good to go and, uh, you know, moving forward with things, that is good news. Um, obviously, don't want to push it. It's going to be interesting for for at least me uh, to see whether or not uh, we are going to see Burrow throw a lot, or you know how heavily involved how how, how the Bengals handle this throughout the spring, throughout the the summer, and then obviously the big the big thing is the training camp because Burrow hasn't had the quote unquote normal training camp so to speak in his career so you know it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of do this pitch count thing potentially once again for joe burrow right and, and this is nothing new unfortunately like he's gone kind of through this whole process of you know in, in voluntary otas and mandatory mini camp whether it's, it's his knee and you know whether like it's been multiple knee injuries now at least in the past couple of years and then in training camp he's just kind of getting his feet under him and, and whatnot and just trying June in a situation where he's like throwing normally and like that's like it's when he's first really doing all that kind of stuff and um, obviously he'll have a, a handful of weeks of rest and preparation for training camp and that's when the, r- the real bullets start flying like at that point because I know there's still a concern about is there going to be anything differently mechanically with how he can throw the football like is there any, is there going to be any differences is, is there going to be negative drawbacks to this whole process and the sooner he kind of figures out those answers at this point when, you know, the pads aren't on and there's no pass rush coming at him, the better he can prepare for that when it does come. But I guess we should relay what, when these dates are. Like, we're not going to know when training camp is until a couple months from now, but we do have some dates for us in regards to the offseason program. So the NFL, I think, announced every team's offseason program at this point. The first day the Bengals all convened together is going to be April, April 15th. And that's only for just a day. That's a couple weeks before the NFL draft. It's going to be rookie mini camps, I believe, in the middle of May. We haven't had those official dates announced yet, but that's obviously when all the rookies and the undrafted free agents kind of come together and practice together for the first time. Volunteer Voluntary OTAs begin May 28th and the run to May 30th. And there's another session from June 3rd to June 6th. And then mandatory mini camp is going to be June 11th to the 13th. So... We'll start to see, hopefully, you know, we have Burrow and the whole gang together for, you know, mid or late May at, at this point. And he may or may not be throwing at, at that point. But if he's starting the process now, there's a, I, I would say there's some optimism about him looking like his normal self. And obviously, everyone's going to be there in in the, you know, mid June for the mandatory mini camp. But I think the Bengals have had good attendance regardless uh, for the voluntary OTAs. Other than Burrow, though, I think like the big story is going to be T. Higgins and whether or not he right. shows up and he participates. We saw what happened with Jesse Bates a couple years ago under a very similar situation, and we can, we can kind of assume that at this point that it would be a surprise if T. Higgins did show up, but if he doesn't show up, we have a good inclination of what training camp is going to be like, and that's a whole other variable with Burrow, too, like how he prepares for the season without one of his main targets, and he's you know still trying to get back 
to 100% with his wrist. So those are the dates, and that's when we can expect to see Burrow throw for the first time. I, I don't know if we want to do, you know, takes on what T should or should not do in terms of OTAs and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I've I've always been the guy, you know, old school, get 100% of the people there and get everybody there that you can and, you know, get get full participation. But we've also seen just in these, you know, swim trunks and tank top type workouts weird injuries happen and I, I you know i'm i'm pretty resigned to the fact and and i would maybe in in a lot of ways agree to it that i don't think t's going to be going to be coming in spring especially if he is not traded uh, obviously i think the thing the time that this talk and, and the Bengals have kind of continued this we look forward to t playing for us this year so i still hold that specific expectation i know some others have been trade 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 and they're going to make a move. I mean, I think that the next phase of that potential trade talk will be a draft weekend. And if something, you know, I think that's when that frenzy picks back up. You know, teams are kind of coming together again in the same same spot so they can talk a little closer. And so that would be the next time, I think. Some, and then obviously, you know, you could maybe net a, a specific pick in that class, et cetera. So that's it. But a, after that, I mean, I think he's, he's there with the Bengals. We know the Bengals are pretty... You know, when they dig their feet in the sand about something, they, they're not moving uh, too far from it. So I think they are expecting him to be on this team. I think it's a, I think also it's a good move because we still don't know the future of Tyler Boyd here. The Bengals re-signed Trent and Irwin. I don't know, losing Tyler Boyd and T. Higgins in the same offseason, we've said it a couple of times, that would be hard for this team to kind of maneuver in the same offseason. So I think we all expect T to be here. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens at the draft. And then we'll see if he ends up showing up to OTAs if he is still a Cincinnati Bengal. I don't expect him to be there either. But uh, regardless, we now know the dates, right, John, of, of what, what to expect. Right. And I guess the T news was the actual news from the owners' meetings this week regarding like the Bengals specifically. Like the Burrow thing was just a report from our friend James Rapine. But yeah, Zach Taylor did speak on T Higgins and you know, gave the same, you know, spiel about, you know, T gives us the best chance of winning the Super Bowl. We're excited to, you know, have another season with him, which is what you would say um, when you want a player on part of your team. And, um, right. Yeah. Like it, it's not, it's not the worst. Like, again, we've, we've said this a number of times. So obviously, if, if there's an angle about a trade, you want to, you know, build up the player as much as possible to create the illusion of value. Maybe not the illusion of value because the value is real with T against with the Bengals. But you're right. Like if there's going to be anything regarding the trade, it's going to be in the draft. But again, the Bengals have operated this offseason, I think, under the full belief that T. Higgins is going to be here, and I don't think they plan on changing that anytime soon. Officially, they have about $23.5 million, uh, $23 million in cap space, and that includes the T. Higgins franchise tag. So if you were to trade him, maybe well over like $40 million in space, well past you know the bulk of the actual you know <laughs> portion of free agency. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're at where they are in terms of where they usually spend for the offseason, they're going to spend, obviously, in the draft, and they're going to keep some rollover or whatnot. But um, in, term, in terms of just how they spent this offseason, I think that's been pretty clear that, you know, they have Teagans in their plans, and it's going to take yep. something, you know, crazy to, to, to change that, I guess. Yeah, and I think we'd be having a different conversation, potentially, if they were a team that was up against it, right? Up, up against the cap and just... You know, it'd be like, oh, man, you got to think about offloading this. But I think that extra cushion, maybe that's some of the cushion you use for a Jamar Chase extension. Maybe it's even something for a T. Higgins extension. We will see. But um, the Bengals are in pretty good shape cap wise, especially with the moves that they have made. You know, Trent Brown coming over, Geno Stone coming over, Mike Gusecki coming over. A lot of good, you know, good, not only good players uh, and maybe even on rental deals, not good players, but um, good value. Uh, on on the deals and the cap numbers and that sort of thing, so they've done a they've done a pretty good job in terms of managing the cap with you know a lot of big contracts and a lot of big things looming in the future. And oh, by the way, Burrow not no longer on the rookie deal either. He's on a contract that's obviously uh, the highest paid. Right? Uh, we'll see what happens going forward there. But uh, let's move on. We have done. We're going to transition to the NFL draft. We've done a lot of free agent profiles. We've done a couple of uh, draft profiles as well. And my guy, John, this this seems to kind of be, I don't want to speak for you. This seems to be kind of one of, if not maybe your dude in this class, uh, at least for the Bengals at 18. And uh, he's one of the most intriguing guys because of the athletic profile, limited snaps, all kinds of different things. But the size the positional need, especially long-term, and the developmental possibilities with this player are 
huge. So we'll say that. John, who you got for us on our 2024 rookie profile this week? You're muted. Really felt good about that intro, too. What a nice word to use, though, in regards to huge. Because yeah. that is exactly who the, the player I want to talk about. It seems like there are going to be, let's, let's call it three, prototype right tackles that the Bengals have a chance of drafting with the, with the 18th overall pick. It's not a guarantee that all three of them are going to be there. But you're talking a guy we've talked about, uh, Talisi Fuaga, J.C. Latham out of Alabama, and Amarius Mims out of Georgia. And when identifying all three of these guys and really breaking them down, Amarius Mims, to me, feels like he checks the boxes that the Bengals look for and the boxes that the Bengals need. And in comparing these guys, first of all, they're all big, right? Like size is not <laughs> an issue with, with any, of these, any of these young lads to play the right tackle position. And it's traditionally a position where you prefer like you know, size rather than athleticism, even though that's a little bit more archaic in, in and of itself. So how does Mims separate himself between all three of these guys? And I think for starters, he is a splitting image of who the Bengals currently have at both offensive tackle spots. He's 6'8", 340 pounds, 36-inch arms, 11-inch hands. That's essentially the same size as Orlando Brown and Trent Brown, if you, if you will. So, And I, I don't think that the Bengals only want tackles who are literal skyscrapers. I think with Orlando Brown and Trent Brown, both of them kind of fell into their laps and they kind of ran with it. But it, there is something to be said, I think, about signing a guy in Orlando Brown to the contract that they did and then taking on another similar body type a year later, I think there's there's something to be said about the comfortability of taking on guys who are built like that, who are very, obviously very rare in their body types. So I think even if this isn't the exact type the Bengals want at offensive tackle, though the evidence may speak contrary to that, I think they're still comfortable with adding another player of this size and his size is more similar to Latham because Latham is also over 340 pounds. Fawag is 320 pounds. It's not like he's a small man by any means. I think the difference is in length, whereas Mims has 36 inch arms and there's no question about, can he hold up a tackle? I think with, with Fuaga, the, the 33 and, a, and an eighth inch arms, it sometimes, it sometimes does show up on film. There's a question about is the ceiling higher at guard. I think all those things kind of factor into it and on top of the fact that we, we did see the length issues, they, they did pop up with Jonah Williams, and they did give him some trouble against the, the more elite pass rushers. So when it comes to then Mims versus Latham, like the, the size doesn't dis, doesn't differentiate either of them from, from one another. They both come from SEC backgrounds. They both played against high competition. Where does Mims separate himself there? And this is where like the Bengals haven't really shown to value high-end athleticism in their offensive alignment as much in recent years, but it's where they need him the most. It's where they, it's where they need to deviate or just venture down that path the most because we talked about this anthony back in november this is the least athletic offensive line definitely in the afc but probably in the entire nfl as well and it's one of the reasons why you had situations where joe burrow is getting you know pressured horrendously against afc north defensive lines because you have five middling athletes and trent brown doesn't really change this for you you still have five middling athletes who are trying to work together and that creates a lot of problems when you're dropping back 40 times against really elite and high-end athletes at, at defensive end and defensive tackle. Miles Garrett and TJ Watt, on top of the fact that they're incredibly strong and great technicians, they're freak athletes. They explode off of the line, and you need elite movers at the tackle position to really gain an edge against some of these guys. And I think even if Frank Pollock has been here for a handful of years now and they haven't invested a ton in, in pure like high-end athletes like what, what Frank Pollock did in, invest in it with, with the Dallas Cowboys and what he was a part with of building that offensive line to where it got with, with Tyron Smith and Zach Martin and Travis Frederick and even Lyle Collins. Like he knows the value of having great athletes at that position. And he did talk about that with uh, Dave Lapham here a couple weeks ago. And I want to share that clip of just him talking about just the, the size and the athleticism of Mims and how special that is. And we're going to share that here in a quick second. Yeah, this the show. Uh, this is Dave Lapham's show by F First Star Logistics, right? Um, yes. And so we'll put this up here. I want to make sure we credit that where credit is due. But um, yeah, go for it. Oh, Mims out of Georgia, coach. He's he fits in that freak category. Like that's they shouldn't make human beings that that size that can move like him. He's 
he's insane. He's maybe a little bit limited as far as playing experience. So it's yeah, all his best football is all still still to come and ahead of him. But uh, like Munoz, yeah, <laughs> I mean, he was hurt. He was a hurt hurt a lot at SC. This kid had some injury issues. I mean, it, it, man, if the, if the football gods say we're going to leave you alone, you're going to be healthy. Woo. Yeah, he is. He is everything: length, width. I mean, height, weight. He's another guy. There's no way if you told me what he weighed. I was like, there's no way. I mean, I, I, I mean, crazy act like you said is is a great word. It's 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 insane. Hand size. I mean, just humongous hands. And and, and I mean, he ran like a five oh something in the yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah, it is. Like, how, how's that possible? I mean, no. How is that possible? Honestly, like. And I, I'm I'm with him. Like the the athlete that Amarius Mims is is rare. And if this were if this were a guy that started two plus years again at the SEC Georgia level and didn't have any injury issues in his past, he would not leave the top ten. Like that that's that's where I find myself like really thinking about Amarius Mims at this point. The injury issues are definitely the biggest red flag in this profile because it's not on on, on the field on the. Field, everything is phenomenal, especially for a guy who's only played 800 snaps at the FPS level. Now, there's only been one other first-round pick at offensive tackle that's played that few amount of snaps that's played under 1,000. It was Ryan Ramchek. And that was only because he played at the, at the D3 level before transferring to Wisconsin. But for a guy that, again, has only had eight starts in his whole college career, he looks really technically sound. Like, I don't think that's the issue here. And I think teams are going to love, like, teams probably do love the tape that he's put on, on display. It is going to be the injuries, though. He had multiple ankle injuries during the 2023 season. He had the tight rope surgery, took him out for six weeks. He strained his hamstring trying to work out the combine, and he, didn't, and he didn't work out his pro day yet. So he has an incomplete testing profile, and he does have those medical red flags. So you're looking at a guy that, if he didn't have that, he would not be available for the Bengals to draft. But because of that, the Bengals probably are going to get a shot at him, maybe compared to even Latham and Fuaga in that sense. So... If some team is going to take a chance on this risk, on these red flags that Mims has, that are honestly we're all really in his control, the Bengals are in a position to really do that compared to other teams because they have two starters for this season, and you have when you have Trent Brown who can only really be counted on for about 500 snaps a season because that's just the average that he's played over the past handful of years. You're probably not looking at a guy that can maybe make it the entire season. Maybe Mims can't make it the entire rookie season too. Maybe he needs a year to really fully develop his frame and make sure that he doesn't have these nagging injuries going forward. But if you can get a combined year out of Amarius Mims and Trent Brown, again, you're managing the same type of body type, but a superior athlete that for the long term can give you answers against the pests of menaces that you faced along the edge of the AFC North. I think this is the ideal landing spot for Amarius Mims to really get off the ground and make sure that his body is, is in order. And when he gets the chance, and he's probably going to get the chance if Trent Brown does go down this year, I think he can be a difference maker at the 18th pick that maybe they wouldn't get in other years. Maybe they wouldn't get in other prospects who didn't have these medical concerns. So there's a lot to dissect here and a lot of things that you brought up that I want to kind of address. Number one, um, you talked about the issues that the Bengals have had along the offensive line with the the athleticism and you know that's the you know the math bomb scores and all that kind of stuff we've looked at that th those metrics with a lot of those guys and they are low at least they were when they were coming out of college and you know some of that a, a lot of that translates on tape when you go against the Pittsburghs the Clevelands and the Baltimores uh you know six times a year if not maybe seven total depending on how the season shakes out and uh, the other thing with aside from having a Miles Garrett and a, and a TJ Watt that are hyper athletic and they just can get, you know, get off the snap so quickly. Those three defenses are so versatile and so uh, th their looks are different and what they do and where they move certain players like a Miles Garrett. They can just continue to exploit. It's not just one continuous spot. They exploit mismatches across the entire offensive line. And so the Bengals kind of go into each one of those games a little bit with a handicap. And I say that saying that this is probably the most excited I've been about the Bengals offensive line as a whole since Joe Burrow's gotten here, right? I mean, so uh, that is something that for sure needs to be addressed. And with Mims' athleticism, I think that handles that. The thing that I, I like about him, aside from the size and the athleticism, and like you said, extremely limited tape, but what's there is good, 
What the Bengals will like about it, and you touched on it a little bit, SEC, Georgia, hyper, you know, just, uh, you know, uber, uber uh, productive team, a team that wins a lot and beats a lot of good teams, that sort of thing. The Bengals are going to like that. And, uh, you know, you go up against the the best competition and your team's going far every year and that sort of thing. They're going to like that. Uh, and they're going to like the mentality that a player like that brings to them. Another element you mentioned, yeah, maybe Mims has to stay if they draft him and, and Brown goes down because that's been, you know, a thing with him here and there. You know, maybe it's a it's a couple a coupling of both of them to play the entire season with the Bengals. Yeah, that's maybe not super ideal, but if there is, what, what I like about this is the Bengals have two veteran guys who have been very, very good tackles in the league for a long time set right now. They're not going into the draft going, we are absolutely desperate for a right ta tackle, and this is a guy that screams to me because of the lack of, of starts, developmental guy, right? And I mean that in, in the most positive sense of the word, not a guy that's like, oh man, he's a you know totally unfinished product. There's a lot to work with there, but with the limited amount of starts, the limited amount of snaps, that's something that I think appeals to the Bengals too, where we can say, hey, we can, we, we've got time to groom this guy. And we have time to groom him behind two guys that, as you also mentioned, are very physically similar. So I, I think all of that is appealing. I think when you look at some things, you know, I mean, there there have been some tackle misses. Uh, by the by the Bengals in a, in a lot of and Jonah Williams was not a tackle miss uh, he just wasn't a superstar or a star player for where he was drafted but I mean you can go back to Fisher and a boy he and I mean the list goes on and on and on and they try and find these guys and um, you know sometimes they're the more athletic guys like in a boy he that they really really thought was hyper athletic and could play a lot of different places on the offensive line never worked same with Jake Fisher right it was kind of like well we could we think we could put him in a lot of different places never worked. Um, so I, I think this guy, like you said, is a true tackle, obviously with his size and everything. I think there is a lot that would appeal to the Cincinnati Bengals, not only as a player, but as a developmental guy to bring along and in this division. So I think in a lot of ways, this makes a, a ton of sense. Um, there are some other guys that I, I think with the other, the extended tape and with more snaps under the belt that, that we've reviewed and we've seen even on this show, that I may lean to a little bit, but um, you know, I think this is a guy that uh, is very appealing. I think, and, and I, I like how you just touched on just the the specific type of development of player that he is, because you're not really developing. You're not really developing. Jesus, I can't really speak his technique at this point, because he <laughs> is already a really good player, and he's proven that you know over the course of his career, albeit very limited. So there's obviously tweaks and you know growth that he can still take. But it's really just developing his body. And I think that's the most important part about what his NFL journey is going to be. He is a rare player. Like, it's already rare enough to be that tall and that large and that dense. Um, but when you're also extremely athletic like that, that, that's a rare body type that I think can kind of scare off some NFL teams. I think because you don't really see many examples, or there's a lot, a lot, not a lot of precedence uh, for him just thriving or types of players like him thriving in the league, it may scare some teams. But the fact that the Bengals are at this point now familiar with this type of player, with this type of body, that gives them, I think, more of a peace of mind of, about how to handle it. And they're going to have a Wendell Brown for the next three years. And yeah, it's just like, here, you got two guys who've lasted in the, in the league very long at this size, which is very rare in its, of, of itself. Learn, learn from them as much as you possibly can. And on top of all of this, right? Right. The Bengals are picking 18th, very obvious. Um, I don't think that they plan on picking this high uh, in the future. I, I think so long as Joe Burrow is healthy, they always expect to make the playoffs. They always expect to go deep in the playoffs. Picking in the teens, I don't think it's going to be something that the Bengals will expect to do much of in the future. I, won't, I would advise them to take advantage of that as much as you can. Get what I think is objectively a blue chip type talent that, yes, comes with risk, and that's why he's available at the 18th pick, but you you will have a very hard time finding legitimately good offensive tackles drafting the 20s or drafting outside of the first round entirely. The vast majority of the very good ones are picked as high as possible. And again, if Mims didn't have the, the specific and unlucky injury history that he has, he would not be available at the 18th. I, I think he would probably go definitely in the top 16, but he's here as like offensive tackle six or five on the consensus board. He might be 
going into the 20s for all we know. But I think what we do know is that the Bengals do have pretty significant interest in him. Frank Pollock obviously loves him. Like, that was not very hard to discern from, you yeah. know, talking about him. He was smiling the entire time. Uh, they talked with him at the Combine. They, they watched barely him get on his words, man. I know, man. He was he was enamored. Like, Frank Pollock has never had this type of athlete with him for the Bengals. He's He really wanted Frank Ragnow. They got swiped. By the Detroit Lions. Obviously, Panay Sewell was their top tackle. Another freak athlete who was huge and technically sound. I, I, a lot of people give Frank Pollock a lot of crap for maybe the lack of developing late-round offensive linemen, but a true swing, at a, a true first-round player whose tape and athleticism and size and pedigree screams this guy has not only a really high ceiling, but a, a higher floor than people can expect. I think this is the type of swing that that the Bengals need to make here. They need difference makers in the first round. And I think a Mary Spence can be that. So you kind of read my mind a little bit, you know, about you had Lapham kind of pie in the sky thinking as, as he always is Mr. Mr. Positive, And I love it. Uh, talking about, well, Munoz came out that way, you know, and that's very true. We've had Anthony Munoz on the show and he talked about the fact that, man, I didn't, you know, I didn't get to play a lot uh, later in my career and, and how, you know, he didn't think he was maybe going to be drafted as high as he was or should should have been because uh, of his overall talent, just because he's missed a lot of time. And the Bengals took a big, you know, in a lot of ways, took a big risk on that. And it paid off as literally the best offensive tackle to ever play. So I, I, I get the line of thinking and I get kind of where Lap's going with this. But, uh, and you kind of mentioned a little bit, I, I like, I still like Frank Pollock. I, I like the the demeanor and a lot of different things that he he, he brings to this team and in, in his offensive line. but. As you mentioned, and as you look across the Bengals' offensive line, four of the five projected starters so far at this point are free agents they had to go get somewhere else. Um, and so the lack of development, and yes, you are correct. There's been a lot of mid-round guys, you know, your your, you know, your Michael Jordans and your, you know, all these, all these players that they have, you know, it's like, hey, you know, kind of mold these guys a little bit. There has been a Jackson Carmen in there. I mean, that was a second round pick, but you're right. You know, there, there's, there hasn't been a top 20 investment. And really, we, we knocked the development. You mentioned a couple of names there that he liked. He didn't get the chance to draft the guys that he probably had, uh, you know, between Jamar Chase being the guy that the team wanted and needed. I assume if he was not there, Sewell for sure would have been the guy and Sewell would have been great for the team, right? And so you figure... Okay, he probably would have had a nice tackle there. And then, of course, Ragnow earlier, who uh, (laughs) it's funny, both those guys are on the lines. But, um, you know, uh, again, a guy that he just kind of had to he he had to go on a fallback option for uh, when Ragnow left and they went to Billy Price. So um, there's a little bit of, you know, you got to nuance, you got to think nuanced with with this a little bit. But the development thing is there. And that's what worries me a tiny bit with this guy because he will need some developmental time given the lack of college reps, college starts, but uh, the tools are there. Yeah, and good news, the, the, the Lions are picking, what, 29th? I don't think they're picking in front of the Bengals yeah. this time. Um, <laughs> you would hope. <laughs> but, but but yeah, like he's going to be, I think, tw- he's 21 right now. He's going to turn 22 during the season. Um, in general, no matter how good you are as a tackle coming out of college, even Panay Sewell was... was you know, needed some time and seasoning before. Now he's an all pro. He's arguably the best right tackle yeah. in the NFL. That was an easy evaluation. I think Mims is very similar in terms of just he looks it on tape. And if he just stays healthy, if he lands in the right spot, he can be just as good. And I think that's why the Bengals are very interested in him. And if I were to if I were to say right now, we're still a month out, if he's available and there's not like a Byron Murphy or a or a Quin- Quinion Mitchell or one of the top receivers just staring at them in the face, I really do think he's gonna be the pick. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, good breakdown from John on Amarius Mims, the uh, George Big Man. Uh, we'll see what the Bengals end up doing there, but another rookie profile and a prospect the Bengals could look at at pick 18. Definitely, I would think he's on their short list, especially with how this draft may fall. Probably going to be pretty quarterback heavy, especially early in this class. We'll see what happens there. And then, you know, the Bengals may have some so the, the pick of a number of guys that are very, very high on their list. We'll see what's going to, what's going to happen. We're going to be here for a little bit longer and we are going to do our first mock draft of the off season. A lot of people do these all the time and God bless them for it. Uh, I like it. I eat them up, but at the same time, uh, John and I just kind of say, Hey, we're going to be a little bit, we're going to be strategic with this. And I guess 
some people hate that and some people like it. I don't know. Uh, but we are, uh, they always provide good talking points. But what John and I usually do is we, we always do about three rounds until later. Maybe we do more like four or five, that sort of thing. Um, just for the sake of time, but we're going to do three rounds here again as well. And that's what we normally do. But what we normally do is we go, okay, let's, let's see who's there. And he and I talk and we kind of come to a consensus and we create one set of picks from the show. I think what we're going to do this time, we're going to go a little different instead of kind of, uh, collaborating. And I mean, we, I always collaborate with the guy, but instead of always collaborating, like we do, we're going to kind of say, you know, I'm going here. And then, I, you know, we're going to kind of have our own set of three picks and you guys can let us know who screwed up, who who killed it, all that kind of stuff. Um, there may be some overlap. There may not be. But I think that we are going to do uh, our own. We're going to do a three round mock, but we're all we're going to do our own picks for each instead of collaborating to create one. And you are you, sir, are queuing up the simulator. Which one are we using here? We're going to use fan speak. We're going to give a shout out to another uh, friend of the program, Joe Goodberry. He updated his overall consensus board. I think this is more along the lines of how just draft media sees prospects instead of just him specifically. So this should give us a pretty accurate representation of where players are projected to go off the board. I think still span uh, fan speak has its own algorithm. So there may be some players who uh, go off the board a little bit earlier than where they're projected or where like they are on the consensus board. But just bear with us. It's going to be pretty fair and pretty general in terms of like, you know, like I think the players are going to be very accurately ranked on the board. And we're just uh, like Anthony said, three rounds, classic difficulty, speed, all that. And let's let's go ahead and get it started. All right. Uh, you are firing it up. We got the spinny wheel going to load yeah, her up. We- my computer sounds like a jet engine. I don't know if you can hear that through the mic, but uh, if, if there is some lagging issues or loading issues, uh, <laughs> please bear with us here. <laughs> All right. So we got it. So first five uh, picks for six up. picks. We got some quarterbacks. Yeah. That's some wide expected. receivers going off the board now. Mm-hmm. Bowers at pick five. Yep. Mims at 10. Got so some he edges is now going off. Latu going uh, pick nine. He's going top ten. It's an interesting one. My guy Fuaga gone. Okay, and so Bengals are up. Yeah, Bengals are up. And hey, there's JJ McCarthy out there for the for the taking. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fash- uh, Fashanu from Penn State is an interesting player, and then of course you got. Uh, two of the top interior defensive linemen in Byron Murphy and Johnny Newton. You also have J.C. Latham, uh, Fautanu from Washington, the offensive line. And then if you really want to go just vintage Bengals first round pick, mid first round pick, right in that 18 to 23 zone, they have Kool-Aid McKinstry, a cornerback out of Alabama. If the Bengals want to yet again go in the Marvin Lewis route and get a first round corner. And I mean, really, I mean, you got Tyler Guyton from o- Oklahoma. He's down the 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 pack a little bit. Jackson Powers Johnson is interesting out of Oregon. Um, so those are some of the the names there going going forward. What what do you have here, John? What's your what's your what's your pick? So Fashanu just obviously stands out like a sore thumb. Um, I, th- I I don't think it's out of the question that he falls this far, I think there is maybe a slight medical concern. His hands a little bit smaller, whatnot. Um, he's definitely a little bit more raw compared to the other top tackle in Joe Alt. Uh, but he's also just a left tackle by by trade, so there is a projection of how he can slide to right tackle. I'm mainly looking at both defensive tackles here, uh, Byron Murphy and Johnny Newton. Uh, I think the consensus likes Murphy a little bit more. But I really like who Johnny Newton is as a three technique. And I know that Sheldon Rankins is a three technique. He's a pure three technique as well. Um, but I, I do think that Johnny Newton is a better run defender compared to Byron Murphy. I think he's more active on a person at basis than Byron Murphy. I really want to see how he tests, obviously, because he's dealing with um, I, I think it's a Jones fracture or something with his foot that has prevented him from testing. Once he does and shows that he is an elite athlete, I think he provides a lot of value here compared to 
most of the other guys. And that includes, you know, like Fashanu and JC Latham and Alfred Stackle. So your pick is Newton. Yeah, I'm going to go Newton. Okay. Uh, I, I am tempted to go with one of the offensive tackles here, but I am also thinking that with oh, you look at it here, one, two, three, four of the top, you know, uh, who have first round grades per this this engine here uh th those are here you may you may get one of those guys to yet fall to you it might be a risk but you may yet get one of those guys to fall to you in the second round uh stranger things have happened obviously i like newton i like fashanu um i'm gonna go the other way though i'm gonna go murphy and i'll, I'll tell you why our guy matt minnick we, we're name dropping like hell today uh my <laughs> our guy matt minnick and i don't want to put words in his mouth but he had put out kind of a cryptic tweet talking about, you know, the Texas tackles and kind of said something about in limited snaps. Murphy actually showed that he could play nose in limited snaps at a more effective level uh, while also being more of a three tech penetrating type guy. So I think you, you maybe get a little bit of a two birds, one stone type of thing. If I'm going to rely on, on Matt Minnick and, and his savviness with uh, the, the trenches and whatnot. So I like Johnny Newton. Uh, you mentioned there is kind of the the injury thing. Uh, right, right now, for me, if I'm the Bengals, if I'm going to go defensive line, I'm going to go with a, a little bit more of a, a known commodity in terms of a little bit bigger program, but also, you know, if there is an injury issue or, you know, it, it lingers or, what you know, whatever that is, um, I, I would default to Murphy, I think, and and maybe you're able to move him around a tiny bit more than you are with Newton. So I would I would go Murphy and you go Newton. And, and and I think that's going to be their logic too. I think they see more gap versatility with Murphy. Um, there's even some metrics that say that he was more productive as a pass rusher in terms of just winning as a pass rusher. I think the production kind of falls into Newton's favor, but I think that's why ultimately he's probably higher on most boards and maybe even higher on the Bengals boards. So we're gonna we're gonna pick your players, Anthony, and I'm gonna write down uh, okay. my picks. Okay, uh, and then we'll compare. Yeah, so, so well, and those. I'll put them in our. I'll put him in our chat. So John was Johnny Newton, right? We we need more Johns. Like the last one was John yeah, Ross, and that, that didn't go any well. So all right. So I think we had Latham uh go off the board very late. I don't even think Johnny Newton went in the first round. Fashani went 24th to the Cowboys. Kool-Aid went to 26th. Um, you know, Troy Frank Franklin, Donnie Mitchell, um, Lad McConkie went man. to the Chiefs. I could definitely see that happening in real life. Yeah, man, Franklin would be a fun player for the Bengals. Oh, man, he'd yeah. be fun. But um, we'll see We'll see where he ends up going. What are you What are you looking at here now since the Bengals went into – I mean, is it is it pretty much offensive tackle only or, again, who's there? Um, uh it's tough. Is it wide receiver? Um, yeah, like at this point, I, I I don't know who you're getting that offensive tackle in terms of like the the scene. Like, are you able to get a starter at this point? That's the risk that you that you take when maybe your guy is not there in round one. Because honestly, I'm look. I mean, the top offensive it's, tackle it's, right now is Roger Rosengarten. Yeah, yeah. So so there's not there's not a ton of options in terms of that route. And I know Blake Fisher has gotten a lot of love from uh, draft guy Jared. He's the right tackle by trade as well. He's a decent athlete. So let's just go ahead and just sort this by offensive tackles because I think that was the, I think those were the top two. And, and we're, we're, yeah. we're, we're doing the old screw job to Frank Pollock again. <laughs> <laughs> like get, get work your magic with a mid-round pick, right? Oh, man. And this, is yeah. why, and this is why I think like when push comes to shove, and even if guys like Murphy and Dune are available, they may just take the top offensive tackle. Like I know that you don't want to pigeonhole yourself into a Billy Price situation again, but I think some of the tackles that were like obviously Fashanu, I think would have been worth the 18th overall pick. I think we can both agree on that. I think the yeah. Bengals will probably agree on that too. So there's going to be a right tackle available there that's going to be worth the pick. But for the sake of maybe getting the best overall player at a position of need, I think that's why we both kind of went defensive tackle. But this is this is the bet we made at this point. <laughs> that's a good way to put it yeah uh what, what are we looking at wide receivers let's go ahead and check that out we got keon coleman Keon's. xavier leggett yeah 
Uh, I think at least one of the Washington guys, two of the Washington Washington guys, um, Jalen Polk, Polk and Jalen Polk, McMillan. Polk's fun, yeah. Polk's a Malachi player. Corley, um, obviously very fun as well. Troy Walters yeah. checked him out at, at his pro day. I don't know, Anthony. What do you think? I'm not seeing the value at offensive tackle, personally. Uh, mm-hmm. Can you show me corner? Please. I can show you corner. Not a lot of value here, either, unfortunately. Yeah, Kalen King. Uh, Sandra still is interesting, but I, I think that's... Um, Josh Newton. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I think I might go... Uh, can you go back to wide receiver for me one more time? Sorry about that. Yes, I, that's probably where I'm leaning as well. Who, who are you thinking about? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not seeing the value at uh, at offensive tackle at this point. I really like the Washington guys, but uh, it, it might be a little bit of a. I, you know who I also like on that list, and I, I got to preview him is Brendan Rice. Uh, that's an intriguing mm-hmm. player too. Jerry Rice's son. Um, I, I see him more kind of third roundish as they have him ranked too. Um, Le- Leggett is kind of sticking out to me. Um, I do like, I do like Malachi Corley as well. I, I will say, um, hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know what? I'm going to go with Polk. Uh, the value isn't there, but okay. I think that's a fun player you can do a lot of different things with. So, yeah, I'm going to go with J- Jalen Polk. It's interesting. I-, I think it was Mike Brenner who said that he resembles Tyler Boyd maybe the most out of this group of wide receivers that's left. Like he him. has a lot of experience yeah, no, out of Washington. I think McMillan was primarily the slot guy there because they had, I mean, they have three receivers that are going to be drafted in the top 100. But, yeah, any of those Washington guys I think would be good. I really like Keon Coleman or Malachi Corley at this at this juncture. I know Coleman has gotten first round buzz, but I, I I think Corley is a guy that the Bengals just haven't really taken a chance on. And if he does hit, it will not only be fun, but it would be a difference maker in terms of just a type of weapon that you have in the offense. And like he may be limited, like people may think that he's limited as a slot, but that doesn't really seem to bother D- Debo Samuel. doesn't really seem to bother the 49ers in general. Obviously, that's an extremely high ceiling for him to hit, but it's very unconventional for the Bengals, and I think that's why you have a you have a chance like here at this juncture to take a guy like that, and I think I think that's what I would do. So I'm going to pick Polk for you, but my pick is going to be Malachi Corley out of Western Kentucky. Okay, I'm going to put those in the chat as well as we continue on for the, our last pick. Uh, and then I had Jay Lynn Polk. Yes, I think we had more receivers kind of go off the board there. We had Leggett go, we had Coleman go, Roman Wilson. We didn't really talk about him, but he's also going to be in that late second range. And then look at the Chiefs, man. They picked Lab McConkey, then Tavondre Sweat, who I know for a fact is going to be... <laughs> Uh, a target for the Bengals in the second round for yep. sure. Yeah. I wonder if there's a world that does exist that the Bengals double up on, on interior defensive linemen. If that's, if that's, uh, I don't think, I don't know that they would do that, but uh, there's, there's just so many, uh, so many good options. this year. Well, I think, I think that it, that reality definitely exists. I think, there's going to be temptation if they do pick Murphy to be like, let's just pair him with sweat again. Like let's just make sure that losing uh, uh, DJ reader is just not going to be an issue at all. It's just the more quality guys that you can throw that position, the better. Uh, so here we are. Says with the new kickoff returns, Corley would be interesting, but I like Polk as well. Thank you. So just to, just to recap real quick, first round, here it is right here. John has, had uh oh that's the second round sorry um uh, let's go back up one more john had johnny newton out of illinois and anthony had byron murphy out of uh texas so both went uh interior defensive line next round and second round john had malachi corley and anthony had Jalen polk both wide receivers so we've we've been 
collaborating on the position groups and the positions that they pick and which rounds they pick them, uh, just not the same players. So go ahead. See, now we're we're really in the weeds if we want to go offensive tackle. I know Christian Jones is is a name um, that was getting like day two buzz. Oof. I'm not I'm not familiar or I don't really know off the top of my head how well he tested, but Anthony at this point, I mean, if you're picking offensive tackle in round three, the expectations of him long term probably aren't that high. So unfortunately, we might have just whiffed on offensive tackle. In general, yeah. yeah. Um, still, about, there are uh, other needs. What about uh, guard or corner? So let's go ahead and check out corner first. So San still's gone. Max Melton, I think, is a decent option in the third. I think he's PFF's 80th. 83rd ranked player. Cam Hart, popular guy at Notre Dame. We'll check out guard as well. Gotta be honest, don't really recognize a lot of these names. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know a little about mahogany. Uh, yeah, can you go to tight end, please? That's what I was thinking too. Theo Johnson stands out at the top, though. Yeah, and then you got Stover, Jaheim Bell. Bengals did have interest in Eric All, but this is too early for him. Uh, I really like Span Ford, but again, too early for him. Ugh. I think I think I know where to lean. Um, he may he may not be the best value according to this board, but again, I, I think well, once you're at this point, Anthony, and you're a couple picks in. And there's a theme kind of developing with the draft, and you're just kind of going off of where where players and where positions are going off. I might as well just stick to it. Like me, I think Jaheim Bell is extremely unique as well, and he's kind of a chess piece in your offense. And he's explosive, and he can gain yards after the catch, which is exactly what Corley would bring as well in the slot. You do need some type of long-term stability at tight end, and again, he's not the most traditional-looking tight end in terms of his physical build yeah, and his skill set, yeah. perhaps, but... I really do think like the the play action bootlegs are still going to be a pretty big component of the offense, and I think Bell would fit in really well with that. And I think he's a willing blocker who can you know really actually make some damage out of the backfield in that role as well. He may not be the best in line option, but you can get those guys like Eric All and AJ Barner later in the draft if you, if you would like to double dip. Um, I I I do kind of like Jaheim Bell in this situation personally. Okay, so you're going to take Bell. Do me a favor, we roll on over to the running back position. Ooh. Please. Another skill position. Yeah, so I, I, I'm i going to be all over Jalen Wright, I think. Um, I, I, uh, I I like Estime. I li uh, there's things I like about Corum. I, I, I think they've put a lot of – he's had a lot of touches, though, right, Corum, hasn't he? Um, and uh, Brooks is interesting, but – I think Jalen Wright as a supplemental player to get your screen game going, to get you some explosiveness. You know, you you, you have Zach Moss now, who's kind of the, you know, he's it's going to be by committee. We we've kind of we kind of know this, um, and Moss is kind of in there to to help you with pass pro and and do some of the. He's kind of a to me Moss is a little bit of a blend of what um, uh, Samaj P Ryan gave you and a little bit of what Mixon gave you, right? So I think, you know, I, I, I look at this and I, I, I like the supplemental backs, but we don't know what's going on with, with Chris Evans. Travion Williams is back, um, but I, I, I still think there needs to be a little bit of an influx of explosiveness and whatnot. I believe Jalen Wright at the Combine did, did pretty well if, if memory serves, and I see the speed. There, there are some question marks for sure. I don't know that he'll ever be an every down back, but I think as a third down weapon, as a gadget weapon, particularly early in his career, that's a guy I lean towards. So I, I would go Jalen Wright for me here. And Jalen Wright, you shall receive. So we have, have our three rounds now. Uh, Anthony went Jalen Wright, which you can see on the screen. And I went Jaheim Bell, the tight end out of Florida State. So look at us, Anthony. Day two comes around. Bengals haven't picked an offensive player in day two since, God, was that Jackson Carmen? No, I guess that was an offensive player. But they haven't picked a skill position guy in day two since T. Higgins. 
we both go with skill position guys here to kind of reload the offense after taking a pass rusher at defensive tackle. But unfortunately, like I mentioned, once you once you leave the first round and don't get an offensive tackle, it does get tough. Yep. So let us know how we did, and we'll we'll recap this for you here. Oops, I did something on my screen that I didn't mean to do. Uh, we're let us know how we did. John had. Again, Johnny Newton out of Illinois, the, the defensive tackle out of Illinois. And then you had Malachi Corley, the wide receiver out of Western Kentucky. And then you had uh, right there, J Jaheim Bell, Jaheim Bell uh, out of Florida State, the tight end. So um, going offense we, and, and what's that? We got one more pick. I forgot. <laughs> we have a comp pick oh, to get to. We do? Oh, that comp pick. Yeah, do. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> So I, 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 I haven't now. addressed. So we're so used to like, yeah, yeah. I haven't addressed running back yet, so I'm gonna make a quick pick and pick Braylon or Braylon Allen, excuse me, out of Wisconsin. The, the okay. Bruiser gives you another okay. element there, okay. but you have another pick to go, man. Ooh, I like my guy Lloyd there too. Um, let's go. Uh, since I already took care of running back, let's go. You put. Let's see. Can you go to? Let's go to offensive tackle again. Let's see what's what that well is at this point. Um. Maybe. There we go. Um, <laughs> same names, right? Yeah. Uh, more or less. Do you know much about Goncalves from Pittsburgh? I do not. I can't say I do. Yeah. Um, And then do me a favor, will you go to corner, please? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kyrie Jackson. That's a fun player. Um I think I think that's where I'm gonna go. I think I'm gonna go Kyrie Jackson corner. I don't like the tackles there. I mean, I, I was tempted to take I think it's Christian Jones out of Texas, uh, the tackle, but um I, I think the Bengals, you know, they didn't they didn't get that veteran corner. Uh, in, in free agency, at least not as of yet. And so I think they may be looking at, uh, they may be looking at a, a player there. And I think he, he maybe brings, uh, some, some good stuff for him right there. Yeah. Who day Bruce is going to call this is six, five, three thirty, So big boy. Um, so yeah. Okay. So the last bit now, now we're done, right? Uh, yes, we are. So to recap, as you can see on the screen, Anthony's picks were Byron Murphy out of Texas, Jalen Polk out of Washington, Jalen Wright out of Tennessee, and then the comp pick, thank you to Jesse Bates, Kyrie Jackson out of Oregon. My picks were Johnny Newton out of Illinois, Malachi Corley out of Western uh, Kentucky, and then Jaheim Bell out of Florida State, and then Braylon Allen, the running back out of Wisconsin. Tell me a little bit about Allen. Do you know? Do you know much about? I mean, Wisconsin backs are usually coming in polished and productive. Um, of course, I haven't looked too hard at. Yeah, I mean, I haven't looked too hard at him. I know he's pretty good, though. Yeah, I, I think he moves pretty very well for his size. Um, obviously, like you said, there's a pedigree with coming out of Wisconsin. You kind of know a lot of this, the pro style NFL schemes and uh, reads that you know those running backs are typically making. I think in general too, like. Zach Moss made such a spiel about how he fits in terms of running out of the shotgun, a lot of inside zone. Uh, Chase Brown, I think, was also really proficient running out of shotgun. I, I do think, though, that the Bengals still need to add on a little bit more under center with their run game, and obviously Allen will come in with experience with that. You lose the size also when trading away Mixon. You don't really have a lot of bulk at the running back position, but so long as you're not getting a, a plotter, there that comes with that size and again i think allen can move pretty well for being like 235 240 pounds so a good mix and i think really diversifies your running back room as a whole which is the whole point you don't really want in my opinion to take another top 50 pick at running back when you have just the, a conglomeration of you know varying skill sets that all kind of mesh together so i think he gives them kind of what they are still missing but obviously if they were to go Jalen Wright and just get you know a track star there that can break off explosive runs I think they can definitely make that work too they're in a nice spot at this point where they can go in multiple directions Allen is just intriguing because I think he moves well for you know also providing that sense of power 
Yep. Well, good stuff. Uh, and that was fun kind of doing our own, our own little plans there. Maybe we'll, as we'll do, we'll probably do, I don't know, two, maybe two, three more of these. We're not going to do a ton more, but we'll, we'll do a, a couple more leading up to the draft and maybe we'll, we'll do one where we collaborate and then maybe another one. Uh, I don't know. We'll figure it out, but that was fun. And you got to tell us who you thought did better. Um, I, I think both classes actually provide a lot of intrigue. So you got to let us know. This is interesting here, John. Nate, who's one of our uh, frequent listeners and, and commenters, saying if the Bengals select Mims, it'll be a disaster and he'll be the next uh, Becton, uh, Mackay Becton, who the Bengals just visited with, by the way. Uh, we just have terrible injury luck. This is now, uh, he, Nate may or may not be right or wrong on this, but this is what I think the Bengals will, and the, I guess this is kind of my final, as we drop the mic and get out of here, is kind of my final thought. This, it's going to be interesting to see what the Bengals do if faced with a decision like a Fuaga versus um, Mims, right? Fuaga's got a lot of tape, a lot of productive tape. He's got that tenacity. He's got a lot of – he's got size. He's He's got that AFC North kind of mentality a little bit, but he's got the short arms. Um, and so, uh, you know, is he a guard, that sort of thing? I would say that a guy like Fuaga may be – a safer, more let's not rock the boat pick, whereas Mims, that pendulum could be way more wild in terms of big payoff or, you know, oh boy, big bust. So I am I think it's going to be interesting, interesting to see which route the Bengals go if faced with, hey, this player's safer, maybe the upside isn't as high, but he's ready to go now, whereas a guy like Mims, hey, developmental guy, we really got to work here, work with him here, that sort of thing. Safer? or ride the ride the pendulum there's definitely that aspect I, I i do still go back to what do they think of fuaga in the first place like I, I think that they view him as a really good player but if they draft him i kind of imagine he'll play left guard over cordell volson and they might just stick him there and then you're out of a tackle anyways like i think that's still a variable that people you know they view fuaga as the safer and better player overall but I gotta look at the long term too. Like there may be long term risks regarding Mims's health, but there's long term projection regarding Fuaga at the next level, and that's a whole thing with Latham too. Like I think with Latham, I would be okay with taking him at 18. I think the athleticism, uh, athleticism concerns, a little bit overblown. It is interesting how he hasn't tested, but if he hasn't tested and he's still gonna go in the top 16, that would probably answer the question as to why he didn't put himself through all that. Whereas if you were to last 18, I think that would he would present himself to be a value there. And that's the same way that I kind of view Mims at this point. I, I do think that he is a true difference maker at that position and just a difference maker in general. And I think as the Bengals find themselves again in this situation where they didn't want to be drafting this high, but they have a chance to really take a really good player and to just elevate the talent as a whole and at a place where they need it more than anything. And yeah, I think the Trent Brown signing means, hey, Let's see what happens at tackle in the draft. Obviously, they're going to target one. And again, I, I don't think that there's a, a better landing spot, honestly, for, for Mims than here. And obviously, that comes with risk. But, you know, that's that's the draft. It's mostly risk. Yeah. And one last thing, our guy, Strawberry Ice, I'm going to be hopping on. As if you, if you didn't get enough of me, which I'm sure you already have, I'm going to be hopping on his show here in just a little bit. So go check that out after we are done shortly. Thanks for tuning in there, Iceman. And... Uh, I don't know. You got anything else, my friend, before we hop on out of here? Happy Easter, everyone. Happy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Happy, yeah. Go hunt some yeah, eggs. Have a good... Yeah. Go hunt some eggs. I, unfortunately, man, I, I'm a little worried. We're supposed to get rain out here the next couple of days, and I'm a little worried my the egg hunts might get a little spoiled uh, or be, maybe more fun, I guess, in the, in the rain. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, we'll see what happens. Have a good holiday weekend, whatever you may be doing. Ladies and gentlemen, John, thank you, my friend. This was a lot of fun, and it feels like it's been a little while, but we got through a lot, and we've got a lot of a lot more live listeners here, a lot on Twitter and all kinds of stuff. So thank you to all of you. And again, you can get this show on your favorite audio streamer, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Amazon, all of that. Go check it out. And as well as the video side of things, you got to go to our YouTube channel. Subscribe there by clicking the show icon underneath John there. And that Cincy Jungle icon, click that show icon. A subscribe option will come up. Please kick, uh, click that. And then, of course, uh, give a thumbs up to the video if you like what we're doing. And click the bell to be notified uh, of when we go live and when new content is available. As if that's not enough, give a thumbs up to the Cincy Jungle Facebook page. 
and keep it to cincyjungle.com and where my guy's killing it, John over at A to Z Sports. By the way, he based that profile on Mims on a write-up he did of him over at A to Z Sports.com. So we'll we'll put that in the show info for you. We will put the Dave Lapham link uh, to that show in there for you as well. Uh, if we can scrounge up the James Rapine article as well on um, Burrow throwing, we'll put all those links in our in our description for you so you can check all those out. And thanks to all of those uh, fine folks for their contributions and allowing us to uh, uh, relay some info on the team's behalf. Thanks to them. So anyway, take care, everybody. Have a good holiday weekend. John, I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you soon, my friend. See you guys soon.